a grace for a minute. What exactly is it? We talked a lot about the, the uh, sufficiency of grace and spent those, those messages talking about the sufficiency of God's grace. In the context of the book of Galatians, grace equals right, right standing that is gained by the work of Christ only. You can't add to it. It's, it's right standing, righteousness before God. In other words, God would accept a person, but only based on what Christ has done. God's grace. We're saved by grace through faith. And having been saved, that, that is the stand, that's what grace means in this context of the book of Galatians. Legalism in this context means a right standing gained through keeping the law. Keeping the rules and regulations attached to the law. In this case, they use the uh, uh, circumcision. It's mentioned here. But it would not have only been circumcision. It could have been any... Who knows what other laws could have been added to um, salvation if the Judaizers had won the day. But the Judaizers did not win the day. And your, your New Testament is evidence of that. And... Um, yeah, Book of Galatians against the false teaching of the Judaizers. Okay? So grace being a right standing. Now, when we, when we say we're saved by grace, here's what we mean. We mean that God has accepted me not based on what I have done, but based upon only what Christ has done on the cross. You with me? If it's by what you've done, then you're in the serious situation with the Judaizers. You would be in their serious situation because uh, we could only be found righteous or viewed as righteous by God because of what Christ has done. We look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We look to the cross of Jesus. And at the cross is our precious Savior. And we look to the cross and there in that moment, as the Scripture says, not only did He die for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. The possibility, the potentiality that was wrapped up in the death of the Son of God. That, that those that would believe that He had died for them, those that would believe that He had died for them, that they will be accepted by Almighty God now and in eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you can see how insidious legalist, legalism in this definition of it could be. And that would be, oh, but you have to keep certain rules and laws. And uh, even in the book of Colossians, it refers to days and weeks and festivals and things like that that had to be kept and, and um, that were connected to. And inevitably, the, the cults that are Bible-based will also try to reach into the Old Testament to force Old Testament ideas and teaching upon New Testament believers. Now, did I say the Old Testament is not valuable for us? Did I say that? Of course not. I did not say, I would never say that. The Old Testament is of, of tremendous value to us. And, uh, and it, for its moral teaching and... Uh, it's guidance that we receive from it. But not for right standing before God. The best the law can do, and that's what uh, it, Galatians tells us too, it becomes our schoolmaster, our teacher, to point us to Christ. That's the purpose in it. We can never say we do not need the Old Testament because the purpose of it is to point us to Christ. Now, I think it would be important, too, for me to make a, a um, distinguishing comment here related to standards of Christian conduct as opposed to legalistic. Because sometimes when a Christian has a standard of Christian conduct, then they're accused of being legalist, legalistic. But it may not be true. Every person in this room today has some standard of Christian conduct. Some standard. Okay, if you're a believer, 
you have some standard. That standard may be uh, that, that, that kind of is in your conscience. It's how you have been taught. It's how you've, been, you've come to understand things. For, for instance, um, let's say today, the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is a standard of Christian conduct. Okay? It's not a legalistic commandment from the Old Testament. But it's a standard of Christian conduct. It is a right and a good one. It is a distinguishing mark of Christians in the earth today. The Lord's Day. Distinguishing mark. Uh, let's say, um, what about language? Christian standards related to how a person talks in their conversation. I think there's a standard of Christian conversation. Okay. We have to think about this. The world definitely talks differently than a Christian should talk, right? There should be some kind of deference there. Okay. Is this legalism? I would say absolutely not. This is a matter of Christian testimony in the earth today. Well, that could be language. Where have we been? Where, where does it overlap? Are we going to go to hell if one slips? No, because it's not a legalistic law. It's not a law like that. It is a standard of Christian conduct. We should feel ashamed. We should feel uh, our conscience pricked. We should feel uh, a, a guilt, some sense of guilt. If, if we're loose in this area and we're talking all the time like the world. And this, this explains some things too because when, when a person is saved and they come out of the world, their language sometimes, sometimes in some cases I guess, it, it changes, but most often it takes time. They have to learn. Paul said he learned that whatever condition he was in to be content. That means that at some point the Apostle Paul was not contented. He learned whatever condition he was. And I think this matter of conversation is the same. We, we have to learn godly conversation. It doesn't just automatically appear. But I think most of us would agree there should be a difference. What about the, the terrible affliction that has hit so many today, and that's internet pornography. This is a terrible flick, uh, and it's, it's everywhere. Okay. I mean, it's so accessible, accessible in private, accessible publicly, e everywhere. What about this? Is this a matter of Christian standard or legalism? I think from our, the context of the book of Galatians, it, it, we, we should say it is not a matter of legalistic issue. It is a matter of Christian standard, however. Or are Christians the same as the world and just taking it all in? Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with this and that kind of thing. When pornography is an abuse of the human body, and mind. So it's a matter of Christian standard. Our conscience has to feel that. Maybe we haven't felt it in the sense that we haven't been taught or instruct, instructed that pornography is an abuse of the human body. It is an attack on the image of God. The Bible says we're made in the image of God. Scripture teaches us that we should live godly in Christ Jesus. So this kind of thing would be an attack on that in that area. And Satan's having, having a party with the minds of people. And we have to be careful. All of us have to keep our guard up. We have to watch. We're living in cyberspace. And floating around everywhere are these images, many of which are ungodly 
and should be resisted with everything we have. Okay? We have to think of this. There's any number of things that we would, we get, would fit into the area of Christian standards. And I think we, we have to realize that these, these, some of these can vary from person to person as believers. That's obvious. They could vary from person to person. One person's conscience might be more sensitive than another one related to certain issues, maybe food or drink. These could be issues in Christian standards that could vary among believers. That's true. There can be standards that vary, but they're not necessarily legalistic if one person holds a certain standard and another one doesn't. So be careful not to accuse your Christian brother of legalism because they have a standard against a certain thing. For instance, what about public drinking? Okay. It's kind of quiet in here. What about this it, as an issue of Christian standard? Okay. I come from the deep south. We go way back for um, as far as um, my county that I was I was born and raised in was one of the last dry counties in the United States. One of the last ones. When I say dry, that means you couldn't sell alcohol publicly. Legally. That's a dry county. So we go way, way back. I mean, way, way back. Okay. When I was ordained to the gospel ministry, I signed a document that said, I will not drink alcohol. The Nazarite, like the Nazarite vow. Okay. So it, it has become a standard in my life. Do I put it on everybody else? No. I don't put it on everybody else. However, don't you think I'm legalistic because I have the standard? And if you do, you're wrong. I have a Christian standard and you have Christian standard. Okay. You respect mine, I'll try my best to respect yours. I could tell you all the reasons why I hold this view. I can tell you the dangers of it. I can tell you the problems of being raised in the home with an alcoholic father. I can tell you that, you know, that from a child, one of my earliest memories is a drunken dad and that kind of thing. I can tell you that, those things. And I can tell you all of the problems associated with drinking. But I'm in South Korea, right? <laughs> Wow, you know all about all of the problems. Oh, when we first came to South Korea, every Sunday morning as I was headed to church, I was avoiding the piles of puke where the drunken men and women had thrown up on the sidewalk. Back in those days, they was everywhere. Oh, but it's their right. No, I'm telling you. That's a sad situation. Had they avoided alcohol, they would not have been in that situation. Amen? Okay? I'm just saying. That's what I've seen. We have to be careful. We have to be really careful. Now, those standards, unless those standards be, become what it means to be saved. Okay, for instance, if, I, if, if we had a standard on the, about the Lord's Day, in which we all do, you're here today. So we have a standard about the Lord's Day. Okay, and we say those that didn't show up today are not Christians. Okay? Anyone who does not come to church today, this is not a Christian. Now what if I said that? Would that be true? No, of course not. That's not true. We don't, one, we don't know why they're not here. They may have gone to another church. Two, we don't know their situation. They, they may have stopped to help somebody on the way. Or some emergency may have come up. God knows all things. So we cannot make it a means related to our salvation. And so grace and legalism and these things that are taught 
in this passage, I think are wonderful, wonderful lessons for us today. And just a few words, okay? Our salvation cannot be reduced to do's and don'ts. It's too precious. It must be rooted in the grace of Almighty God. Out of God's grace, we live in a godly way, being led by God's Spirit and instructed in God's Word. Amen. Let me say that one more time. And it's on, your, on the board. Out of God's grace, we live in a godly way, being led by God's Spirit and instructed in God's Word. This is the truth. This is what we must long for, that our lives will be godly reflections of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not in any way reduced to just the do's and don'ts, this and that, but the Spirit of God working in your heart and the Spirit of God working in my heart, living out God's grace in this world today. That's why the Apostle thought it was so terrible so terrible for them to change the message. And all around you, this message, everyone wants to change it. Change this message. Make it something else. And we can't do that. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast about it. Amen? I'm seeing a miracle today.